Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. It is time for our kids to go to uh, Children's Church. So, uh, kids, if you'll come on down. They, they are over here on the side. Miss R, there she is. She is here. So, kids, come on down. All right. And that's exciting to see this many kids in church. Amen. Wow. Give the Lord a hand for that. Thank you, parents, family members who bring these kids to our services. Man, what a, what a great sight to see that many kids. Hey, we're going to be talking today, continuing about an active service. And the active service is actually doing what, we're, what we said we're going to do. Today, we're going to be discussing in Matthew chapter 25... But before we start, we're, we're, I want to introduce to you, some of you, or reintroduce some of you, to a ministry uh, of the Kairos ministry, the prison ministry. As many of you know that some years back, we were kind of active in that, uh, that Kairos prison ministry, but we're going to reintroduce that to you today as a church ministry. And uh, we've got a short video that we're going to play in just a moment, and then Jerry Wood is going to come, and he's going to share, because he is active in that he... And his wife are very active in our uh, church here, but they're also active in the, the, the prison ministry through Kairos. And so they're going to come and share, or he's going to come and share with you in just a moment. But let's go ahead and, and show that video, guys, real quick. Kairos is a Christian nonprofit that shares the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ with those impacted by incarceration. Three Kairos programs work together to serve the spiritual needs of incarcerated men, women, youth, and their families, Kairos Inside, Kairos Outside, and Kairos Torch. Kairos Prison Ministry began in 1976 with the first three and a half day weekend in Rayford, Florida. In 1979, the men doing Curcio in prison changed the name and the program to better meet the needs of the incarcerated. The nine volunteers who founded Kairos, affectionately known as the Nine Old Men, named it Kairos and created the program, which is very close to what we know today as Kairos Inside. Kairos Inside ministers to inmates in both state and federal male and female prisons. Kairos Inside brings both positive and negative leaders together for a three and a half day weekend of carefully coordinated talks, discussions, meditations, and music led by a same gender team of volunteers. Kairos Inside is not just a weekend, but continues the influence of the weekend through continuing ministry. Weekly prayer and share groups allow for inmates to strengthen their relationship with God. In 1989, Kairos Outside was created to minister to the female family members of the incarcerated who are doing time right along with their incarcerated loved ones. Kairos Outside seeks to provide a safe place, exposes weekend guests to acceptance in a Christian setting, encourages them to share their life's journey, creates an opportunity for them to develop and strengthen their relationship with God, and offers an alternative to living their life in isolation. Kairos Torch began in 1997 to mentor youth offenders ages 25 and under in both youth detention centers and adult prisons, with a weekend program specifically developed for teenagers and young adults. Kairos Torch also creates a safe place for youthful offenders to realize their God-given potential through the one-on-one -on -one mentoring of a Christian volunteer for six months after their initial Kairos weekend. Since starting in 1976, Kairos is now in 37 states and 9 countries while always looking to expand. With Kairos in more than 500 correctional institutions and communities, there's a good chance Kairos is available near you. Kairos has over 30,000 dedicated volunteers who donate over 3 million hours of volunteer service per year. Kairos weekends build Christian communities inside the prison. This positive influence results in reduced prison violence, improved behavior amongst the prison population, reduced recidivism, and returns more reformed men and women to their homes. Changing hearts, transforming lives, impacting the world. Visit kairosprisonministry.org, call 407-629-4948, or email info at kairosprisonministry.org to find out how you can get involved. Up and Take just a moment and share, and again, we'll be on Sarah's microphone. There you go, brother. All right, can you hear me? Okay. I'm here today to talk to you about Kairos Prison Ministry in general. 
And I think if you uh, have paid attention to the political situation here in the last few years, you notice that a lot of politicians will talk about prison reform. And we have to kind of ask ourselves, why has that become such a big topic? You know, are they really interested in people or are they kind of embarrassed about the numbers? What I will share with you is that the United States, if we consider per capita or per 100,000 people, the United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. In fact, if we compared ourselves to the United Kingdom, we incarcerate five times as many people as they do in the United Kingdom. Now, as bad as that might sound, Oklahoma is worse than that. In Oklahoma, we incarcerate one and a half times more people than the United States numbers. So something has to change with what's going on in the prison ministry. That slide um, that we just showed, I would share with you, you know, the good news is that we're now in 10 different countries and still over 500 different prisons. What Kairos does inside the prison, inside the prison yard, is we're attempting to create a Christian community inside. When that's successful, that Christian community is able to transform lives, is able to decrease prison violence, and you know still inside the prison is one of the most segregated places that you can find in this country with the different gangs. But when we create those Christian communities, everyone can come together. That Christian community helps to reduce recidivism. The Kairos motto is listen, listen, love, love. Now, I could talk about uh, Matthew 25 and 36, uh, where the, the scripture talked about, I was in prison and you came to visit me. What I want to share with you is about Joseph. In the Bible, Joseph is the first one mentioned to have gone into the prison. He was completely innocent. He hadn't done anything wrong. And while he was there, God used him. Now, we can talk about the Apostle Paul. When he was Saul, he had all kinds of reasons for which he should have gone to prison. But when he was Paul, he went into prison because he was sharing the love of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, both did time behind prison walls. So God has always had his people inside the prisons doing his work and his will. Now, what we have an advantage of today is we have the opportunity to go inside the prison walls, share the love of Jesus Christ, and we get to come out when we want to come out. So I want to kind of leave you with my story as in how I got involved in prison ministry. And so I'm going to ask my wife if she'll raise her hand. I want you all to know I got it going on here. <laughs> so about 21 years ago, my wife comes home and she tells me or she, she says, I'm going in to minister to the young boys. I want to know if that's okay. Now, if you've met Willie Mae, you know I couldn't just say no. I needed a reason. So immediately I began to hatch this plan in my mind. I'm going to go into the prison with her. I'm going to find all the reasons of why she can't do this. And then I'll have something to say, nope, you can't do this. Now, just like you guys chuckled just then, I can imagine God chuckling also when he heard me say that. Because when I got inside, we went in for three days. When I got inside, I began to see how through Kairos prison ministry, how God's love melted hardened hearts. I began to see how God's love through Kairos ministry changed the hearts of these young men and drew them to Christ. And so where I intended to stop my wife from doing the ministry, God ended up getting two for one. And so as the pastor talks about service and focuses on Kairos Prison Ministry this month, I hope that many of you will consider investing your time, your effort, your energy, your resources into Kairos Prison Ministry. Amen?
Amen. Thank you, Jerry. Good job. Good job. Amen. You know, some time back when um, Jerry and Willie May joined our church and we began to talk about some of the things they were in, and he shared how they were part of the, the Kairos ministry, I got kind of excited because we, many of you that have been here for some years know again that we are connected, we're connected in some way to Kairos ministry through Rick as he was here and he ministered uh, to, to the, through Kairos, but when he left, then that kind of faded out. But what I was excited about, and I began to pray of how we could institute that back, that ministry back through our church. And so I began to visit with Jerry, and, and we began to pray over that. And, and I, I just felt the Lord impressing upon my heart that that could be part of our connecting to serve. And so what I wanted to do, instead of just making it a one-time thing for him to just mention, that we're going to spend the month of October going over the Kairos ministry. And so each Sunday morning, we're going to have another uh, piece of that ministry presented to you. And then he's going to share some more about each specific piece of it. But if, even if you're here today and you say, well, I'm not sure about going into uh, a prison you realize that that's not the only part of that ministry. As many of you uh, were here before, that we there were other things we do. We bake the cookies and fix the cookies and uh, do the prayer chains and send out little notes and cards and different things to to those that they're ministering to. So it's something I really believe that we can all get behind. And as Jerry even said to me, if he could get one more person to maybe join in with the the ministry, that it would all be worth it. And so uh, that's what we're going to pray about, that God would raise us up to minister through the Kairos ministry, to make a difference in men, women, and young people's lives. And so we're, I'm very, very excited about it. And as I've always shared with you before, if you've joined our church, one of the things I always tell you that if you look around and say, well, I'm interested in this ministry, but we're not doing it. It's not because we didn't want to do it. It may be that we just don't have a person to lead it, and you may be that individual. What well, they are those individuals. We didn't have a Kairos ministry when they came, but it's on their heart, and now through them, we can also minister as well. Amen? Because today, what we're going to be looking at is active service. It's time, I believe, for the church to get active. You know, one of the most difficult things of service is the ability to stop talking about it and to start doing it. Because we love in the church, if we're not careful, we, can, we love talking about service. We do whole years of focus on connecting to serve, amen? We've talked about it all year long. We have seminars on service. We have groups on service. And we love, love, love talking about serving. That's the easy part. The difficult part is when we decide we're going to stop talking about it and start doing it. My friends, can I tell you today that I believe that we at First Baptist West have been talking about serving for now three quarters of the year. And now we're headed into the, the time for us, I believe, that God wants us to stop talking about it and start doing it. I'd like you to take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 25. Jerry kind of alluded to that just a little bit this morning in his presentation, but I want to go just a little bit deeper. Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 34, reading through verse 40, and we're going to be talking about serving. Now stop talking about it and start doing it. I'd like you to stand in honor of reading God's Word this morning. Very quickly, the Bible says here, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, uh, come you, blessed by the, my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. Here go. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer to him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Listen to the response. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Father, we thank you and we love you. We thank you for the great worship that we've already had. Thank you for the presentation of the ministry that was given to us. And now, Lord, as we take the next few minutes to get into your word, I pray, Father, that you would drive our hearts 
Father, that you would drive our minds, and Father, that you would drive our bodies into service to bringing people to Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We've been talking about Jesus coming again over the last couple of weeks. Well, now we're going to include this part as as we see here now. Jesus is now talking to the people, and he's trying to get them to understand something about the idea of service, and he's showing us the particulars in what we would call active service. It's, again, no longer talking about it, no no longer learning about it, but actually now stepping out and doing it. And Jesus is trying to get us to see here what that actually means and what does it actually look like. And so we see here, first of all, what Jesus is really trying to get us to understand is this point right here. Service is found in deeds. In other words, that our service is not important on what we say. Our service is important on what we do. Because I want you to understand something, my friends. Your actions show your faith more than your words do. We can go around and we can talk a lot about what we think we should be doing, what the church should be doing. Here's things that individuals in the church should be doing. But we talk and we talk and we talk. And my friends, listen to me. Nobody ever hears our talking. The people that we're talking about here, they're never going to hear us. The people that are in need out in Lawton, they're never going to hear us talk about it. They're, listen, they're never even going to attend a seminar on serving. They're not. The people that we are going to talk about with Kairos going into the prisons, none of them are ever going to get to be in here, hear us discussing service. It's what we do when we go to them. On Saturday, when we get a chance to go out to the M28 ministry, the bridge ministry, none of those people, we'd love to get them here. Amen. It'd be great to have some of those people that are in need come to First Baptist West. But they're never going to hear me preach. They're never going to see us talk about service. But what they're going to do is when we go there and we begin to hand out food, we begin to hand out clothes, we begin to join in worship with them, we begin to put our arms around them, let them know that we love them, that we're there for them, and if they need something to contact us. My friends, that's what's going to get their attention. Jesus is trying to get us to understand that. The people we keep talking about are never going to hear us, but they're going to see us when we go out and do it. We're here in just a few moments. We're going to have lunch supporting Operation Christmas Child. Listen, there's not a single one of those kids are going to tune into this service and hear me preach. They're not going to hear us do singing. They're not going to hear us talk about giving to Operation Christmas Child. What they're going to do, though, is when we go in there and we have lunch and we pay for that or we do boxes ourselves, man, when, when they get to those boxes, how many of you have ever seen one of those videos? We show them here where those kids get those boxes and open them up. Man, isn't that exciting? Man, I get excited now even thinking about it. Listen, those kids are never going to hear me preach. They're never going to hear you say anything. But I'm telling you, they're going to know about Jesus when they take what we did, not what we talked about, but what we did by filling up those boxes. They're then going to open up their box, and inside that box are going to be some things that are going to encourage the fire out of those kids. They're going to get excited, and there's going to be a person there going to tell them, hey, some people in America love you. This is from Jesus. Who's Jesus? Well, he's the one that wants to save your soul. Listen, my friends, those kids are going to benefit from our working more than our talking. We can talk about Operation Christmas Child all we want, but until we do something about it, the deeds do nothing. The the action does nothing because we're not doing anything. So Jesus here is trying to get us to see the fact that our actions speak louder than our words. As a matter of fact, James writes in in James chapter 2, he writes this, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. In other words, you say, oh, we'd love to, we want you to be taken care of. We we have a seminar. We had a, we had a conference on how to take care of you. And we say to them, peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? If you tell them to go, go, go be warm, be filled. What does it do for them? They Guess what? They're still going away cold and they're going away hungry. He says, thus also by, by faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. 
Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Those things that we talk about, those things that we learn about, those things that we teach about, those things that I preach about, they are going to be useless if we don't put them to action. He says, what does it profit? Oh, we have seminars on feeding the needy. We have, uh, we have discussions on Operation Christmas Child, Kairos ministry. We do all that, but what does it profit them? Nothing. But when we actually put it to use, that's what Jesus is saying here. Put what you say to use. The comment that I want us to understand is this. The marks of a faithful Christian or faithful church is not in monumental programs, ministries, or grand accomplishments, but in the meeting of common needs. So people are not going to be benefited by us being able to look around and say, Woo, look at our great, great, great building at First Baptist West. We have an amazing building. Or look at our great programs that we have here. Look at the stuff that we have going on in our church. Look at the, listen to the great music and the great musical program. Listen to all of that. That's not what people are going to be listening to because they're not going to hear it. And I've also told you that I've never, never once have I had in my mind or desire to be the largest church in Lawton. I couldn't care less about that. But what I care about is that we're one of the most effective churches in Lawton. By not what we have out here, not the grand accomplishments, not the grand building, not the grand services, but what are the grand activities that we do outside of the church? That, my friend, is what's going to make the difference. Now, those things that we have, a great service is cool to have. A great music program is great to have. Great other programs are wonderful to have. But listen to me. It's until we take those and get them outside of the building that they're not going to profit anybody. Jesus said it's not about all the stuff you have. It's about what you're doing. As a matter of fact, even when John, the, John told his disciples, said, go ask Jesus if he were truly the Messiah. Now, I want you to understand, John baptized Jesus. John declared that Jesus was the Messiah. You remember all that? But when he was where? In prison. He said to his disciples, go and ask Jesus, are you the Messiah? Listen to Jesus' response. Read it on the board. Jesus answered and said to, to them, go and tell John. He wants to know, I want you to go tell him the things which you hear and see. He says, the blind see, the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the, have the gospel preached to them. Not once did Jesus say, go tell John, look at the number of people I got following me. Go tell John to see how many grand services we're having. He says, I want you to go back and tell John what you are seeing and what you're hearing. And what you should be seeing and hearing is this, that you are seeing the, the, the people who are blind, they now see. The people who couldn't walk, they're now able to walk. I've met some of their needs. You go tell him the lepers who no one wants to be a part of. No one has, wants to be around them. And they're being ejected. They've been sent off. He says, you go tell them that you are seeing me down there with them, touching them, healing them. He said, you go tell them. You tell him that the, you see the people who are, couldn't hear now that I've made them be able to hear again. You go tell him those who are dead that I've actually raised them up. And you go tell him the poor people who no one wants to do with. I'm going around them on a daily basis, preaching the gospel to them. You go tell them. Don't tell them all the grandioso stuff that you're seeing people following me. You go tell him what you're seeing the, me doing by taking care of the people's needs. Amen. It's not about our stuff. It's about what are we doing with it. He said, you go tell John that I am meeting the needs of the people of this world. Go tell them. So we see that it's found in our deeds, my friends. We need to not be talking about it anymore. We need to be going out and doing it. The second thing that I want us to look at very quickly as we begin to wrap up here. Service should be a natural, humble action. It should be something that we just do. 
It ought to be just something we do. We, we, why? Because it's the right thing to do. That's what we look at. That it's the right thing for us to do. That we ought to be going out, meeting the needs, and doing it until it becomes natural to us. My friends, the church ought to be doing about, ought to be about doing that which is right. Doing that which God has called us to do. Just doing these things. Why should we feed the hungry? Because, listen, it's the right thing to do. Why should we be visiting those who are lonely? Again, it's the right thing to do. Why should we be going to the prison, visiting them and trying to encourage them and lead them to Jesus? Because it's the right thing to do. Why should we be doing all the stuff that, that we're doing? Why should we be doing even more? Again, because it's just what we should be doing as Christians. We shouldn't have any more meetings on it. We shouldn't have any more lessons on it. We shouldn't have to have any more sermons on it. It's just the right thing to do. Why? Because Jesus said, this is what you do. And you say, well, that's just not who I am. That's just not the kind of church that we are. My friends, listen to me. It should be who we are. It should be the kind of church we are. And we ought to do it until it becomes natural. I, several years ago, when I was coaching, that whenever I would do drills with, with my girls and on, the on my team, we'd do drills day after day after day after day. And every day they'd come to me, when are we going to stop doing that? And I said, when that drill becomes natural. Because I don't want you getting on the floor during the game, and I don't want you to have to figure out what am I going to do. I want it to be natural. When we're on a fast break, I don't want you to have to think, which place do I go to? You know where you're going. I don't want you to have to wonder, is that girl going to break on the right side or the left side? I want you to know where they're going. Because I don't want to have any moment of hesitation. I want you to know that when you set that screen that you're rolling off, that you don't have to think about it. I want it to become natural to you. So we did it over and over and over until we got on the floor. And you know what? They didn't have to think about it anymore. That was just what they did. My friends, the church, we, if we're not that kind of person yet, or we're not that kind of church yet, we ought to keep doing it and doing it and doing it until it becomes who we are. We ought to be those people. How do you know we should be those people? Jesus said that because of what you did, because of who you are, this is what you did. The people didn't even think what they did was a big deal. They didn't even realize what they were doing. Service is not about us doing remarkable things or even getting noticed for them. That's not what it's all about. They said, when did we see you this way? When, when did we feed you? When did we clothe you? When did we visit you in prison? When did we give you something to drink? When? When did we do that? He said, every time you did it to the least of the, these, my brethren, you were doing it to me. They, didn't, they were doing it because it was the right thing to do. And that's what they were supposed to be doing. And they never thought about it. They never had to think about it. And I want to wrap it up very quickly. Let's wrap this up. I want you to understand something very important here, though. For all of you here, for all of you listening and watching at home, this service was not about getting into heaven. He did not say, you are here because you fed me. You are here, not here because you gave me something to drink or you... Fed, gave me clothing or you, you visited with me or you took care of my needs. He said, that's not why you're here, but you're here because of Jesus. But as a result of that, this is what you should be doing. The Bible tells us, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It is not a gift of God. He said, this salvation is the gift of God and not of works. Not because of anything you've done, because if it was, then you would have a grand opportunity to boast about it. In other words, he doesn't want us in the church looking around going, hey, we did better than you. We did better than you. We're better than you. And oh, man, we're a whole lot better than y'all. He said, you have absolutely nothing to boast about. So it is not our actions that get us into heaven. But because we are going to heaven, it ought to influence our actions. So make no mistake about it. 
We are not getting to be with Jesus on the merits of our service. You are not getting to heaven. Not one single person is getting to heaven because of the merits of your service, because of what you've done. It's you cannot stop up and say, because I did this, I get to go to heaven. Because I did this, I get to go to heaven. Because I, was, I did more of this than I did the, of this, I get to go to heaven. He says it has nothing to do with any of that. So do not stop and say, well, I, I, I got to give just a little bit more because I think if I give one dollar more, I'm going to get to be in heaven. There's not going to come a time that somebody's going to stand before Jesus and he said, you know what? Dude, you almost made it. You know that day the preacher was talking about giving toward uh, the special offering? If you had given that day, that would have gotten you over, man. But you didn't. Sorry, you're out has nothing to do with that. And he's not going to look at somebody and say, man, you barely made it. Because when it came time, remember that Saturday that you weren't going to go to to the M28 Ministries and you decided to go, dude, you're lucky you went because that was your mark. Not that. Has nothing to do with that. Because it has nothing to do with my activities or my actions. It has to do with Jesus. Can I tell you this? God is not looking at our service. He's not looking at our record when it comes to salvation. He's not looking at what we do, not what we say. He's looking for one thing. He's looking for the blood of Jesus. If you'll remember back in Exodus, when Moses told them, he said, look, tonight the angel of death is coming. And here's what you're to do. You are to take a lamb, a perfect lamb. You are to sacrifice it. You're to take that blood and you're to put it above the doorposts. Mark your doorposts with the blood. Because the angel of death is not going to walk up to your house and knock on every door. Stick his head in and say, well, how many do you have in here? Oh, you got 10. Good job. Because you got so many into your house tonight, I'm going to pass by. He's not going to knock on the door. Hey, let me see. Give me a count. How many times did you listen to what Moses said? Oh, that's enough. Then I'm going to pass on by. He's not going to knock on the door and ask you how many times you did this or how many times you did this. He said, all I'm going to do, I'm not even going to knock on your door. I'm going to go by the door, and the only thing I'm going to look at is the the blood. And if that blood is there, I don't care how many you got in the house. I don't care what they've done inside that house. I don't even care what they're doing inside that house. The only thing I'm interested in is did you have the blood. Can I tell you, my friends, when God looks at us today, he's not going to look and go, oh, you're the pastor. Good. You got, you got a pass. Oh, you're a deacon. Oh, you get a pass. Oh, you're a Sunday school teacher. You got a pass. Oh, you've been a member for so many years. You get a pass. Oh, you've been baptized. Oh, you get a pass. Oh, you read the Bible every day. You get a pass. You've been perfect attendance in Sunday school for five years. You get a pass. He is not looking at any of that. You know what he looks at when he looks at our heart right now? He looks for the blood of Jesus. That's all he's looking at. So we are not, this scripture is not saying, because you did these things, I'm going to let you in. He said, because of who you were, you did these things. Because of who we are, we should be having active service. Not just seminars on it, not just teachings on it, not just sermons on it. Doesn't matter how good they are. He's going to be looking for the blood of Jesus. And he's going to be seeing, did we take that and do something with it? I shared in the first service, and I'll wrap it up with this, that I I don't care at all how many people talk about the sermons I give and how good they are. 
I don't care about that. What I do care about it, though, is that people look and see, because I love Jesus, my life was a service life. That people can remember what I did for Jesus. I hope my sermons have some impact on you, but I really hope my life has had impact on you. I hope that you've seen Jesus in what I do. My friend, that's what we ought to all want. Not that you hear about Jesus from me, but that you see Jesus from me. Each one of us the same. Because my friends, he's not looking at your position. He's not looking at your actions. He's looking for the blood of Jesus. And as a result of that, now those people who are in need should be able to hear Jesus from us. We have great opportunities. It's time to stop talking about it, and it's time to start doing it. It's time to stop talking about accepting Jesus, and it's time to accept Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of surrender. I'd like to have the praise team come back up, and as we step into this time, my friends, there's one, two questions I want to ask you right now. The first question is, when God looks at your heart right now, when he looks at your life right now, will he see the blood of Jesus? And the only way he's going to see that was at that moment of your life that you realized that you couldn't get to heaven without him and that you needed Jesus. And that you asked Jesus to come into your heart, you asked him to forgive you of your sins, and you asked him to save you. That you received the blood. Because what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? nothing but the blood of Jesus. He is looking for the blood. Do you have the blood of Jesus? Not because you say, I've been to church, but because I have received Jesus into my life. That's the first question. Second question is, as a person, if you say, Pastor, I have Jesus, the second question is this. Are others able to see Jesus in you, in your actions, in the things that you do, the things that you say, are people able to see Jesus in you? Is that fire of the blood inside of you? When they see your life, what do they see? If you're here today or you're at home and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, right now is the day to receive him into your life. Receive the blood. Receive the blood. If you're here and you know you're saved, or you're at home and you know you're saved, but man, your life has been burdened down by things of this world, and you've gotten so focused on other stuff that, 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 that what you're doing is not reflecting what you say your faith is. Now's the time to turn that back and say, God, take control of my life again. Let people see you in me. Let, you, let them see you in me. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're about to step into this final part of our service, and it's time for you to respond. You at home, it's time for you to respond. I'll be down front. Others will be ready to pray with you. You can call the church right here, right now. Father, hear us. See our hearts. See the blood. Father, if you don't see the blood, then convict our hearts Father if you see the blood do our lives reflect it and if they don't then encourage us to, to be active in service let us do it until it becomes natural to who we are convict our hearts today Lord as it's time to serve and whatever methods you have, it's time to serve so that people can come to Jesus through us. Father, hear, hear our hearts. See our hearts. Guide us to respond in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to stand.